world's remotest areas, demands from people a different attitude to flight. This is not a job for those looking for status or frills. It's for people who simply love to fly. And almost as a bonus, these regions get what they so badly need, a versatile and dependable transport system. In the easternmost province of Indonesia, Irian Jaya, the Stone Age ended only decades ago. The Papuan people have lived here, cut off from the rest of the world, for tens of thousands of years. Covered for the most part by a thick blanket of tropical forest, this is the fifth largest island in the world, and the distances are enormous. Because there are no roads, the hill tribes of the interior depend exclusively on aircraft for their contacts with the world outside. It is just incredibly beautiful to fly through this country. The landscape may be mostly green, still the shape of the terrain, the mountains, the rivers, the mangrove forest in the low country, it is all so awesomely beautiful, so rough. And add to that the eternal snow on the Karstens range, it just gives me a tremendous kick. Here, there's no other form of transport than flying. So if you want to develop this country, that is one of the most primitive in the world, with one of the most primitive peoples, you have to fly. Otherwise, it is totally inaccessible. It was the missionaries who began flying here in the early 20s. Today, everything needed is still flown in. There's no pencil, not a scrap of paper that isn't flown in. Through air transport, the outside world enters a very closed society that's been isolated for centuries. And slowly it gains an enormous influence that makes itself felt more and more. The missionaries brought Christianity and Western education to the Papuans, and with it, a flying infrastructure that supports the largest concentration of bush aircraft operating anywhere in the world. Although the map of Irian still has small portions that remain uncharted, it's sprinkled with airfields, and the Papuans have become very familiar with aircraft. When put in a car, a Papuan family is said to have asked the driver, when do we take off? These 100-pound sacks of coffee have been carried for two days over 12 miles of steep hills and dense forest. When sold in the towns, this generates a useful income. Without aircraft and their dedicated pilots to fly this out, life for these people would be much bleaker. Um, pat pulam, pat kilo. It's a feeling for your fellow man, maybe. We can sit comfortably in the rest and live our little lives. But I came here, got a fantastic experience, and helped my fellow man in another part of the world. They are a fantastic people. I have really lost my heart to the Papuans. <laughs> After an F-16 fighter, the Cessna 185 has become Hans Decker's mount. The 185 is a simple, strong, powerful plane. It requires only short runways, and its spring steel undercarriage can take a tremendous beating. There are no navigational aids in Irianjaya. The weather can change rapidly. The pilot is alone, dead reckoning his way through the rugged terrain. Every takeoff and landing requires total concentration and faultless judgment. The old bush pilot was a guy that loved the people, loved the job, had an enormous drive and perseverance. 
and did this difficult job with a relatively light aviation knowledge and experience. But runways like this at Apogo leave no margin for error. It slopes up by 12%, is only 750 feet long and 40 feet wide. Landing an aircraft with a 36-foot wingspan and a full load requires not only considerable piloting skills, but an almost unfair measure of luck. For Hans, danger is routine. He could have been an airline pilot. In the Air Force, you work on something that requires a, a higher motivation, and a lot of tax dollars have been invested in you. And to take these skills and only apply them for your own gain, well, I just didn't think that appropriate. It's 10 o'clock in the morning, and Hans decides to call it a day. The clouds have come down and locked off the valley to Timepa. He may have been able to squeeze out of here, but Hans weighs up risk against necessity. Only a few miles from here, his predecessor died in a crash, making a non-vital flight that should have been cancelled. Losing a day's flying is better than losing your life. Bush flying needs two ingredients, a great pilot and a great plane. Well, this airplane is, is basically hand-built, and uh, as opposed to some of the newer airplanes, uh, all the components were hand riveted. There's lots of manual labor involved in the manufacture of the airplane. It's a tough airplane. It's a well, well designed airplane. It's a, it's a high lift airplane. Uh, it's a good old reliable engine, the old Pratt & Whitney 450. The combination is just hard to beat. The de Havilland Canada Beaver is regarded as the best of the bush planes. Dependable, indispensable. In Alaska, unlike the rest of the United States, it's about the only way that we can transport uh, people and their equipment uh, in and out of all the places they want to go. There's just no roads here, and without an airplane, you'd, very little would get accomplished. Flying from Lake Hood in Anchorage, Dave Klosterman's company is one of the many operating into Alaska's vast interior. Today, the job is to carry a passenger and a load of building wood to the Youngstown Bend in the Yentna River. The dangers of flying in the harsh conditions of Alaska are considerable. I think the danger is, tends to be overrated in many cases. It has more to do with experience and learning over a period of time so that you can accomplish what needs to be done rather than terming it automatically dangerous. It's June and the Yentna River is flowing at full strength, taking a lot of debris with it. The glacier water is extremely cold. Just one small miscalculation and the plane can be lost. A drifting log could rip off a float as the plane touches down at 80 miles an hour. In the four months of summer, the pilots need to earn enough to get them through the rest of the year. The days are long and the work demanding. Well, I've worked for a couple of different airlines in years past, but uh, it, this is the kind of work that I like. It's different every day, something new, and uh, you meet lots of interesting people and have a lot of interesting experiences, and that's what I prefer. Dave values his beaver above just about everything else. It's virtually irreplaceable. If I was going to marry an airplane, it would be a de Havilland beaver. <laughs> it's probably the greatest little bush airplane ever built. And uh, they've been around for many, many years, the last one being built, uh, I believe, in 1958. And uh, there's nothing built since that will accomplish the same things, the same amount of work in and out of the same kind of places and conditions. Bush flying is not the exclusive reserve of light aircraft. In Bolivia, old airliners are used to maintain essential communications. Here, old aircraft and high peaks make flying risky. It is dangerous. But now that we have VOR and other navigation equipment, we have a lot more experience. Today we can say we have a lot of knowledge. 
The pilots before us have pioneered this work. They took the risk. Now it's not so very dangerous. We're en route from La Paz to Palmira. While crossing the almost 20,000 foot Andes, Captain Walter Bolivian calmly reads the paper. It's a routine. We know the aircraft, the terrain and the mountains very well. You can almost say that even with our eyes closed, we know exactly where we are. La Paz, Bolivia, built in a dip in the Alto Plano. At 13,000 feet, the highest capital in the world. Here in the thin air live two million people. People with a big appetite for beef. But cattle cannot survive the harsh conditions of the high country, so all the meat has to be flown in. In the back country, the Beni, an enormous marshland bordering Brazil, the only economical commodity is cattle. Millions of head are herded here. Walter Bolivian flies in whenever cattle are available for slaughter. People live on farms in small communities. Life is simple, the cattle providing their only income. Palmyra supports a herd of 14,000, spread out over a large area. And like most cattle stations, it has its own runway. All the runways in the Beni are dirt. Only Trinidad has a hard surface, but they're doing major maintenance on that, so you can guess how good that was. San Borja is reasonable, lots of gravel. But most runways are like this, grass and dirt, and some a little worse than others. The designers of the Convair 440 could never have imagined their plane being operated like this. It was one of the last short-haul piston airliners made. The aircraft was designed to haul passengers off decent paved runways and is not really suited to the work it does now. I fly since 1955. I've flown every type of piston aircraft that flew in Bolivia. Even the B-17 that used to be a carniciero. No jets. I never flew jets. But in my 35 years of flying, I've flown them all. The 1957 Convair 440 survives in this environment, but only barely. Its passengers won't be so lucky. The cattle will be slaughtered tonight using crude but effective tools. Tomorrow, La Paz can count on a load of fresh meat. Bolivia has a number of operators specializing in carrying meat to La Paz. The yields are marginal, so only old planes are used. The Convair is a new plane by Bolivian standards. When I started, it was great fun. But after 35 years, you've seen it all and things become a bit dull. I mean, I need a vacation. Cargo and meat haulers in this country cannot afford to have vacations. Never. So for 35 years, all I've done is flying. Now I feel I need a few days of rest, a small holiday. The term bush pilot was coined in Canada in the 1920s. Bush pilots played a vital role in opening up the vast wastes of the north. Cargo haulers like Air Manitoba will transport anything and everything, even live polar bears and whales. Pilots Mark Mestag and Harvey McKinnon are flying a supply trip to a number of Indian communities. Their aircraft, the Curtis C-46 Commando. Typical mid-1940s airplane. This one here was built in 1944. Uh, pretty old-fashioned, pretty straight, do it yourself. Yeah. Not much modern technology into it. It's nice for change, but uh, it's a lot of work. A lot of outside work, a lot of physical work. 
That's keeps sure. you in shape. A few miles north of Winnipeg, the roads end. Here begins a world that is the exclusive domain of the aircraft. The commando is loaded with 10,000 pounds of just about everything imaginable. Food, beds, car parts, a snowmobile, a soft drinks machine. It's a definitely a remote area up here. And you really can't expect any paved strips up here because the cost of installing them uh, this is as good as it gets here on the gravel strips. We bring in all their food and, and the supplies for these people to live. So if the airplane wasn't here, whether it's this airplane or another airplane, uh, these people couldn't live here. It's uh, that's that vital nowadays. The C-46 is perfect for the job. It can carry 16,000 pounds into all the 3,500 feet strips up here. And because it's an old aircraft, fully paid for, it can do that very economically. The commander's Pratt & Whitney R2800 piston engines produce 2,000 horsepower and an incredible noise. During takeoff, even with headsets, the pilots can only communicate with hand signals. The C-46 is a very stable aircraft in the air, but the controls are heavy to operate. Landing the C-46 can be a humbling task. Even in a mild crosswind, the C-46 becomes very hard to land, and even harder to control once it's on the runway. To Mark and Harvey, being a bush pilot and flying the C-46 is just another job, and not even the one they would like best. Well, there's fun in it, yes. Certainly there's romance in it. I would love to keep flying them in a museum. <laughs> but they're, they're a phasing out airplane. The, the days of the C-46 are dying. I'm a young man, so I have to look forward. Oh, I'd rather fly the 757, no doubt. This is the original no-frills airline. The pilots have to do the loading and unloading of the plane themselves. The sun sets as they position to Pickle Lake to spend the night. Tomorrow they're off to the north. Flights to the northernmost regions take four to five hours and the C-46 is not fitted with an automatic pilot. Being a bush pilot in northern Canada is a hard but essential job. Aviation has made it possible for southerners to live here. Early morning in Palmyra. The temperature is already approaching 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The 18 cylinders of the R2800 engine aren't in the mood to start. The Convair 440 used to be pressurized and air conditioned, but to increase the payload, everything that was not essential was taken out. That also reduces the number of systems that can break down. To make ends meet, downtime for maintenance must be kept to a minimum. 25 slaughtered cattle have been loaded only minutes ago, and the plane must get to La Paz as soon as possible. Since the Convair does not have any refrigeration, the meat would spoil within hours. To get to La Paz, the conveyor has to climb to 16,500 feet. 
The flight time is 90 minutes, and most of that is spent climbing, which is hard on the engines. In good weather, the mountain pass to La Paz is crossed easily, but the weather can change rapidly, trapping the plane among the peaks. Turning back to the plane also means the loss of a valuable cargo. So the pilots are faced with a difficult decision when the weather turns sour. The meat haulers are approaching the end of their working life. The Air Force is taking over much of the flying with the C-130 Hercules, and the planes the Carnicieros need are getting rarer and harder to maintain. Within a few years, a road through the mountains will be built, and refrigerated trucks will bring in much of the meat. Walter Bolivian will then, at long last, get his vacation. <laughs> Flying in developing regions often means the difference between life and death. The pilots are volunteers, dedicating a few years of their lives to this cause. When Hans Deckers arrived in Irianjaya, he found the pilots flying for the mission highly motivated, but the operating procedures frightening. It was all done by the seat of the pants, highly dependent on the individual skills of the pilot. But in that way you leave room for error. You keep open traps that people will eventually step into. And if you apply the philosophy with which an airline organizes its operations and plans maneuvers like takeoffs and landings and en route in the mountains with, as a final objective, flight safety to these Cessnas, then it works out that people don't have to reinvent the wheel every time again. The wheel has been invented and test flown, and if you stick to the procedures, nothing can go wrong. Now hoeft niet iedereen zelf het wheel uit te vinden. Het wiel is uitgevonden en test gevlogen. En als je het op deze manier doet, dan is er niks aan de hand. A lot of things used to go wrong. Statistically, the odds were that every pilot working here on a three-year tour would crash an aircraft, often fatally. Safety had to be improved, not only in the air, but also on the ground. Okay, uh, Apple, uh, next item. I've been there again this morning and it's, uh, it's still horrible. You know, and I think it can be improved. I checked it, uh, I just measured it, it was, it was only 11 meters. And it was even narrower than I thought. Uh, what I want to propose is that we, uh, for instance, close it uh, as of uh, the 31st of December next year. So they've got a year's time to, uh, to do a three months job of improving it and then call it a day. Uh, now, then we're still having a problem with people after a year from now having to get there like Potters, I mean, there's a real old guy who has to walk, I mean, 20 miles to the jungle over there. I mean, he's old. Yeah, you know, really, I think, you know, if, if we give him a year for a three months job, that's enough. You know, we work our ass off to improve the flight safety. That's the least thing they can do. The pilots really do want to maintain the service. But the people of Apogo will first have to improve the runway. This is too small. If we dig there and put the earth over there, then we can make it longer. Now it's about 750 feet and we need at least 1,000 feet. Yeah, but without money the people can't work. They're also asking where the tools and plans so that we can get started. The airfield is here for the people of Apogo, not AMA. This is not my view, but as far as AMA is concerned, the field should be closed. Yeah, well, if there's money, we can do the job in two months. Hans Deckers has introduced strict rules for the AMA pilots, which wasn't easy. The pilots had to be convinced of the advantages of operating like an airline. Now that standard operating procedures are being implemented, the services are improving, even though flights are being cancelled more often. We still got to have enough operational flexibilities that even though we, we stick to the rules, that we at times we can use common sense so we can still, you know, make a trip meet. 
Uh, I, I, I disagree. You know, uh, I've been there and uh, when, when I came in AMA, that's, that's how I started to fly with uh, lots of operational flexibility. And you just end up with too many uh, potential traps for, for, for accidents. I, like this week, you know, I was in exactly the same situation in Timepa. Uh, the clouds were moving in. By that time it was already 10 minutes past 10 plus the wind was blowing. And I just called it a day. I'm convinced that if you fly by the rules if we've set them, then it will work. It was, to my opinion, extremely dangerous. It is a miracle that not more accidents happened. Look, if you don't have clear references, then you must every time a certain mountain wind blows over a strip or the grass is too long or the runway is a bit soft, you must guess if you can take this load out or that load in. Or it is turbulent, what speed do I need just after take off? It was too much seed of the pants, and that takes a lot of experience. So that was a problem when you got new guys to fly here. You had to train them for many months to give them the experience before you could make them fully operational and send them anywhere. Pilots work here for a period of two or three years. So if training takes too long, a lot of money that should be spent on productive flying is lost. AMA is a non-profit organization, getting its funding from gifts and nominal fees. The Cessna 185 is unbeatable in this line of work. But it's no longer being made and is still as expensive as when it first came off the production line. Great care has to be taken to preserve the pilots and their planes. Strict as they may be, the operating procedures make sure that the important job is being done, though they may forever change the face of the bush pilot. The old bush pilot was a man with heart for the people, a heart for the job, and with a lot of drive and perseverance, but with a relatively light baggage of aviation knowledge, he did this difficult job. And the new guy, well, he is identical to the pilot in a fighter squadron or an airline. But you must not come here for the money, or if you can't stand that there are no fancy restaurants or whatever. You must believe in this work and love the challenge. Let's say that the heroism, if that ever existed, has been taken out of it. The machoism is gone. Now you must concentrate and do your job properly and it will work out. But whatever you say, it remains bushfly, because the land is so utterly challenging.